Right, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's right. So I'm going to talk a bit about what we're doing at Signal. Um, it's not going to be so much new trends, I think, in post quantum cryptography, but more a story about our experience uh, trying to put existing or standardized post quantum cryptography into practice. But I think there's a lot of interesting things we're learning in the process. Um, but I also am going to spend a bit of time talking about many of the places where we really need help. We have some wide open problems, and I'm hoping that some of these new trends, the work that we're seeing here, um, are going to be able to, to solve these problems for us. So um, uh, here's a plan of attack. I'm going to start by saying a little a bit about Signal, what we do, and what our needs for post-quantum security are. I know many of you are very familiar with us already, but I did talk to a few of you who did not know what, what Signal was. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay. Uh, after that, I'm going to use this... Um, dichotomy of boring cryptography versus fancy cryptography that Das is going to talk more about later, I think. Um, neither of these are pejorative. They're both complementary terms. And at Signal, we actually love boring cryptography. Um, but I found it was a very handy way to kind of divide the problems that we're facing, the challenges we're facing at Signal. Okay. And we're going to see, I want to try to convince you that the boring cryptography is still actually very interesting when we try to put this stuff into practice and um, that we're actually making good progress here, okay? But then when we get to the fancy cryptography, this is stuff we still need, um, but we have a lot of wide open questions. Really. So uh, let's get into it. Um, Signal, what are we? Signal is a global scale private communications app. So I'll try not to be too marketing speak um, here, um, but you know, what, what do we mean by that? So our core feature is we're a messaging app. We have one-to-one -one messaging, group messaging, voice and video calling, right? But to have a usable app, you know, you don't secure people if they don't use your app. Um, we need a lot of other supporting features. Uh, contact discovery and management, you need to connect with people. You need to be able to block people. Um, identity, we need profiles, usernames, control over who can see what parts of your identity. We need account back. Backup, spam prevention, stickers, reaction, group link, badges. Some of these may sound a little trivial, but each of these features ends up you know, being part of the attack surface, uh, leading to secu security considerations. So let's talk a little bit about um, what we see as our threat model, because that may be a little different from uh, many other messaging apps. So we aim to protect our user data, of course. I mean, this is an uh, end-to-end encrypted um, application. Um, and this, by this, we mean messages, attachments, call contents, and whatnot. But we want to protect metadata, too. We want to protect information about who's in groups together, uh, the social graph in general, who's talking to whom. Um, and so we go to, to Great Lewis to do that. It's not just what we protect, but who we protect it from. We protect it from outsiders, of course, third parties. We protect it from our cloud providers. We don't uh, trust them. But in addition... Uh, we protect it from our own administrators. We do not ask our users to trust us. Uh, and that certainly means that um, we have some pretty interesting challenges and use a pretty wide range of cryptographic tools. So um, let's uh, get into this uh, boring, fancy dichotomy a little bit and look at them. So um, this is an absolutely incomplete inventory, right? I just want to give you a sketch of the scope of the problems we are facing. So um, boring cryptography, secure messaging. Of course, we do secure messaging. And I, it pains me to put this in the boring uh, section because uh, the security definitions are so subtle. Uh, there's so many properties, especially when we're talking about things like deniability. Um, but the fact is this protocol is built from um, pretty fundamental primitives, um, you know, key exchange, max signatures, um, KDFs, things like this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we also use uh, noise protocol channels um, internally and to collect, connect clients into to our hardware enclaves. Uh, our sealed sender system is sort of like a, a very elaborate hybrid public key encryption <laughs> um, system that, that we use to protect metadata. So we don't know who is sending a message to a recipient, but we still have the capability of blocking abusive behavior. Uh, we use uh, more standard vanilla uh, HPKE throughout. We use signatures, AEAD, Max, you name it. Um, kind of unsurprising there. Okay. Uh, we also, though, need to use some fancy cryptography. 
part of us trying to not know who's talking to whom, who's doing what on our platform means whenever possible, we want users to access the platform through an unauthenticated channel. So we don't know who is accessing our servers. Uh, well, how do you authorize anything that way if you don't know this, who this is? How do you do authorization without authentication? Um, well, there we use anonymous credentials, right? And uh, we use them quite extensively. Uh, there's also places we use verifiable encryption that plays nicely with our anonymous credentials, um, particularly in the group system. I'll talk more about that a little later. Um, our new version of our secure value recovery system, which is uh, used for backing up account information, uh, uses password protected secret sharing, and the workhorse behind that is an oblivious pseudo-random function. Okay. Uh, we're considering an application that may use a Diffie-Hellman-based verifiable random function. Um, and also we're starting to use some partially blind signatures as a lightweight alternative for our um, uh, anonymous credential system. Because sometimes we don't need the full power of anonymous credentials. Okay. Um, for the, uh, the OPRFs and the password protected secret sharing, we have a paper at OSDI that uh, you can read a little more about that. <clears throat> okay, so I haven't said anything about post-quantum security yet. Uh, but I think from this, it's pretty clear that we have a lot of work to do um, to really migrate to post-quantum crypto. So how are we thinking about this challenge? Well, we have an immediate concern about harvest now decrypt later attacks where an attacker could collect network uh, traffic um, off the network, wait till a quantum computer is available and then um, solve the Diffie-Hillman, uh, solve the discrete log problem on curve 255.19 and decrypt our traffic. Um, and here we're concerned about protecting both the data and metadata, right? These are problems we want to solve today. Longer term though, we wanna understand fully post-quantum secure alternatives for all parts of our clients and infrastructure. Uh, we know we've got a, a lot of work ahead. We wanna know what's easy, what's hard, what's open, where to focus our efforts uh, so that we can do this in an organized way. We don't wanna be caught off guard. Um, on that note, um, we will move to hybrid secure systems uh, a little earlier than people may think is needed, but it's part of uh, kind of a side of the fact we have side effect of the fact we have so much work to do and we need to gain experience with these tools. Right. And so when we think the costs are reasonable, um, we will go ahead um, and start getting the job done. Good. Um, but with that said, hybrid is a key word because we do not want to take away any existing security guarantees from our users, all right? When you're building a new system, maybe you can have the question of you know, to hybrid or not to hybrid. For us though, if we promise that we're not going to take away existing security guarantees, that means we have to continue providing the Diffie-Hillman based security and uh, we have to go hybrid. So as long as we think that Diffie-Hillman based security has value, uh, yes. Uh, so, like, uh, w one thing I was wondering is that for, let's say, the U.S. government, they have this timeline of 2030 is the hard deadline to transition to post-quantum crypto. Mm -hmm. Does Signal have some, like, deadline internally that they are aiming for? Uh, no, we, we don't have a, a deadline. Essentially, we want to move as quickly as possible on the Harvest Now Decrypt Later um, problems, and then as quickly as is affordable on the other problems. But you'll see towards the end, there's a lot of things that we don't know how to move, especially when we get to the fancy cryptography, we, we don't have solutions. So, um, and so, yeah, well, well, more about that in a bit. Um, but no, we don't have hard deadlines and partly we're a very small organization. So we kind of need to be op opportunistic and um, solve the problems that we can solve quickly. Right. Okay, good. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about that boring cryptography and why it is actually interesting. And uh, here we're going to do this in three parts. I'm going to talk a bit about PQXDH, which was our first step into production post-quantum cryptography. I'll talk about how we formally verified it and some of the interesting things we learned in that process. And then finally, one of the interesting um, potential attacks that we found in the formal verification of the first revision of our protocol is a Kim reencapsulation attack. And I think it kind of shed some interesting light on potential Kim security properties. Um, so I want to point that out. So first, while we have a long list of problems we need to solve, um, 
Fortunately, our data security is almost entire. There's a few exceptions, but it's almost entirely rooted in the security of one-to-one -one messaging for us. We use one-to-one -one messaging to bootstrap group messaging uh, to bootstrap calls. Right. So this is a place we need to start. And not only that, it's the handshake in our secure messaging protocol um, that's the root of everything here, uh, which is nice. So how do we do secure messaging? Well, this is kind of what we're knowing, known for. It's Signal Messenger, and we have the Signal Protocol uh, developed by Moxie Marlinspike and Trevor Perrin in 2014. It's our 10th anniversary now. Um, this consists of two main parts. There's the X3DH handshake, extended triple Diffie-Hellman which consists of three or optionally four Diffie-Hellman key agreements that you feed into a key derivation function to get a shared key. Um, once the session's established, uh, it's the keys um, maintained by the double ratchet, which provides continuous key agreement. Together, these give us some pretty important guarantees, forward secrecy, post-compromise security, mutual authentication, and a form of cryptographic deniability. Uh, but you don't have to look too hard to see that this is not post quantum secure, it's obviously contingent on these Diffie-Hellman assumptions. Our underlying group happens to be Curve 25519. So uh, what is PQXDH then? PQXDH was a small update to X3DH, a minimal update to X3DH um, to provide harvest now decrypt later protection uh, for our messaging. Uh, and we deployed it. It went into production in late summer of 2023 last year. So anybody who has signal on their phone, uh, you're using it right now. <clears throat> okay. So the goals from what I said earlier here for the protocol design or requirements are, are pretty clear. We're only changing anything if we can provably provide HNDL protection against future discrete log solvers. Um, but we have to do it with no loss of our current diffie hellman based guarantees. Uh, even though it's implicit in what I just said, calling out explicitly a non-goal, we're not trying to protect against active quantum attackers. If we did on accident, we'd be happy. Or if we could for a reasonable cost, we would be happy. Um, but that's not the goal of this design. And you'll see we, we don't, right? It, it's completely vulnerable to a, an active quantum attacker. And it is boring. I really, it, we did the minimal thing we could do. What we did is we took X3DH, those uh, Diffie-Hellman key agreements, we said, well, let's take a post-quantum chem, encapsulate a shared secret, and drop that shared secret into the key derivation function along with everything else. Right. Um, done. We could go home. Right. <laughs> Pretty simple. Uh, let me say a little more because when we look at the formal verification in a bit and some of the attacks, uh, these details about the roles the keys play are going to be relevant. Um, so this is the core computation of how we do key agreement in PQXDH. All of the keys in orange are elliptic curve keys. The new things in, in kind of this aqua color are post-quantum. Um, IKA and IKB are Alex and Blake's identity keys. Uh, these are uh, verified out of band and they provide authentication. Um, EKA is an ephemeral key just generated for this um, protocol run by Alex. Um, SPK is a signed pre-key and the, the objects that are in curly braces are signed by Blake's identity key. Okay, so we assume uh, SPK and PQPK, um, they're signs so they cannot be tampered with. Um, then we also have OPK, a one-time pre-key. Uh, you might ask, well, why is it one-time pre-key versus ephemeral key? Why not just um, make them both ephemeral? Well, in reality, this is an asynchronous protocol. So um, Alex may be trying to contact Blake when Blake's not online. Uh, Alex gets these keys from an untrusted key distribution server that server may have honestly run out of one-time keys for Blake. Uh, this happens. Eric could dishonestly withhold keys. Um, it is untrusted. In any case, we compute the Diffie-Hellman key agreements. Uh, we take uh, Blake's signed um, post-quantum chem public key, use it to encapsulate a new shared secret, and just as I said, we concatenate that with the rest of the Diffie-Hellman agreements, feed it to a key derivation function, and get our shared secret. Uh, this is what it looks like with the actual protocol run. Blake prepares what we call a pre-key bundle, which has essentially everything that's needed to perform the calculation. Uh, I just walked through uh, all the public keys and signatures. Sends this over to Alex. Alex verifies the signatures, uh, performs that core key agreement calculation to produce SK, the shared key. Then uh, importantly, uh, for what comes later, um, uh, 
Alex prepares some associated data, which now is just the concatenation of encodings of the two identity key public keys. With the associated data AD and the shared key SK, Alex encrypts an initial message, you know, maybe saying hello, whatever the first chat message is. Um, it actually may end up being a typing indicator in practice. Um, <clears throat> but uh, encrypts this into what we'll call the message ciphertext, and not to be confused with the chem ciphertext, and uh, sends the message ciphertext along with all of the public keys, um, key identifiers that Blake's going to need to know which keys to retrieve and so on, uh, over to Blake. Blake has everything needed to perform the same calculations, prepare the associated data, perform the decryption. If the decryption succeeds, then we've completed the protocol. We have a key agreement and we can move forward. So this looks like it achieves our goals. We didn't take away any of the Diffie-Hellman entropy. We left the structure of the protocol pretty much the same. We added post-quantum entropy, right? But still, even that sketch isn't really a protocol. Like what properties do all of our primitives have? Um, how are the messages formatted? How are the keys encoded? What exactly do we sign and how do we sign it? So these details really matter. We need specifics and we need proof. And this is where things start to get interesting. Um, so that's where formal verification is coming in. So and this is joint work with um, uh, Karthik, Charlie, and Franciscus. Uh, you can read more. We don't have an e-print up yet on, for this, but we'll have a paper at UZNIX24 uh, describing this in some detail. Uh, so uh, the kind of parts I want to go through here, I'm going to talk a bit about the tools we use. Um, and how we use them, what we model with them. Uh, then get into some detail about like how we write security goals in ProBerif because there's, like, it's a, it, an interesting challenge and uh, you can do it wrong. Um, <clears throat> after that, I wanna talk a bit about how we combine tools, CryptoBerif and ProBerif, a little uh, more about that later to find attacks in ways that any tool on its own couldn't quite do. So let's talk about those tools. Uh, the tools we use are ProVerif and CryptoVerif. ProVerif performs analysis in the symbolic model where all of the primitives are assumed to be perfect by default. And when we look at some of the examples in a little bit, you'll see just how powerful that assumption is. Um, <clears throat> but with that power, uh, it gives us a tool that's fully automated. So while this is a bit of an exaggeration, there certainly are in cases we can find where this isn't true. Generally, when you run ProVerif, it's either gonna produce a security claim with a proof, or it's going to find an attack and give you an attack trace that you can walk through and kind of say, oh my goodness, <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe I didn't see that. Um, so uh, very nice tool. CryptoVerif on the other hand, performs analysis in the computational model. We're talking about uh, game hopping proofs here, more familiar to our pen and paper proofs that we'll, we'll write. Um, it supports, that's a euphemism. We'll say it needs manual proof guidance for, for anything that's very, very interesting. Uh, it's um, definitely not fully automated and uh, a much steeper learning curve to, to work with um, than ProVerif. Uh, very importantly for this case though, with its uh, recent PQ extension, CryptoVerif is post-quantum. Okay, so, so what are these things? Um, <clears throat> What do we do with this? The core of a ProVerif or a CryptoVerif model um, is a process. This is kind of describing what different agents do. And uh, anybody who's done a little programming, I think you know you can look at these models and, uh, and read it right away. You can learn to write these things very quickly. Uh, this is the initiator process. So this is basically describing what Alex did in the protocol run I described before. And uh, just step-by-step, step, Alex gets a pre-key bundle from the server and verifies signatures. Um, encapsulates a shared secret with a PQ chem public key, generates an ephemeral secret and a uh, ephemeral public key for the elliptic curve, and computes uh, Diffie-Hellman key agreements. I just did DH1 through three here. Feeds the results into a, um, a KDF. Uh, yeah, don't look too closely at the details. I edited some things out of our, our real models. Uh, you, you can look at our real models online. Um, uh, so I'll give you the link here in a bit. Um, but generates that session key. Then something that's a little bit different from how we'd write a regular program is we tell ProVerif that an event just happened. And this event is that the initialization is done and we pass in to that event, essentially the tra transcript. I was the initiator, R was the responder. 
uh, true that that's whatever that we're using uh, one time three keys. It tells us what keys were used, right? So we essentially see we're done. This is a transcript of the operation that's recorded for analysis later. Uh, once that's done, we can go ahead, prepare the associated data, perform our AEAD encryption, send the messages. Uh, so pretty simple. So uh, what do we model with these tools? On the protocol side, uh, we model an arbitrary number of communicating agents running processes just like the one I, I showed you. Um, we model a trusted PKI uh, to capture the, the fact that our identity keys can be verified out of band. Uh, we model this untrusted key distribution server, and we model a connection as just one encrypted message from Alex to Blake. Uh, so we're not um, going into the, the ratchet protocol that follows this up. On our threat model, we model that identity keys can be compromised at any time. The one-time ephemeral and post-quantum keys can be compromised for special security goals, and we'll see that in a little bit. Um, uh, we model that a quantum adversary could arise at any time with explicit power to break our Diffie-Hellman primitives. Similarly, a chem adversary could arise at any time with explicit power to break our chem. Uh, if both of those happen, it's bad news. <laughs> so um, we also model timestamps on attacks because we're very concerned about the order of these operations. We want the protocol to be done before Diffie-Hellman is broken. We're talking about harvest now to crypt later protection. Good. So kind of <clears throat> give you an overview now of kind of the big picture of how we work with these tools. Okay. Everything starts with a natural language protocol specification. And you can find the specification for PQXDH on Signal's website. Um, <clears throat> but from there, we need to turn it into a formal specification. And this has several components. There's a protocol model, which at its core consists of those processes like I just showed you. Uh, there's also security goals, and we're gonna go into some detail about writing security goals here in a bit. Um, we also need to specify our cryptographic assumptions. I said we're using AEAD. Well, what properties does it have? Is it uh, CPA indistinguishable, CCA indistinguishable, ciphertext integrity? We need to be clear about that. Um, we also need to specify the compromise model. What powers do we give our attackers? Once this is done, uh, we feed the specification into our tools. With Proverif, uh, generally, we're either going to prove a security claim, which if we did a good job modeling, um, that, that's going to be what we want. If we didn't do a good job modeling, it might not be worth much. Um, or uh, if it fails, we find an attack. We can look at that attack. And uh, it's a protocol flaw. We have to go back and fix the specification and start over. With CryptoVerif, on the other hand, maybe we pr prove a security claim, but if not, we just fail to prove. What do you do then? Uh, well, you might experiment a little bit. You might see if you can add something um, to, to get the proof to work. Um, maybe you just need to refine those cryptographic assumptions, but maybe it is a protocol flaw that you need to fix. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, can you explain like the pros and cons of ProVerif and CryptoVerif? So like, let's say ProVerif gave us approved Will we still have to do crypto verif, or can we just be happy with the proved? Uh, that depends on you. I would, I would still want to do crypto verif. Yeah, I, no, I, you know, it's a different nature of, of proof. I, I think that we really need to do a proof in the computational model. Uh, I think that pro verif is uh, like an excellent way to find, you know, design flaws quickly uh, for your protocol. Um, so, would but, you say these yeah. twos are like complementary and kind of? will fill the entire space of attacks or? I'm sorry? So are these two attacks complete uh, or two uh, proving models or methodologies, formal verification, uh, like orthogonal and also kind of fill the complete? Yeah, they're, they're not exactly orthogonal. There is quite a bit of overlap. The, the models are written in essentially the, the same language. Um, but, um, Let's say, I, I think it's going to become a little more clear when we look at some of the power that we give attackers in Proverif that Proverif is very black or white. The encryption is perfect or it's absolutely broken. Um, where uh, with CryptoVerif, um, you're talking about um, game hopping and probabilities. And that's the way in the end we really need to analyze the, the protocol. Um, but... Um, with Proverif, it's easy to quickly get very full coverage. Um, 
So these are assistants, I think, and they're very important and helpful in this initial design process. Um, but like, we're not done. I think there's a lot more, more work we need to do, uh, both in improving the tools, uh, making them more usable. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think, you know, trying to understand exactly how they fit together. Um, but uh, for us, in the end, it is the, um, the security proofs that came from CryptoVerif that let us feel at Signal that uh, we did not break our Diffie-Hellman-based security and that we attained Harvest Now Decrypt Later protection. Right. So for us right now, how we see it, it is the CryptoVerif result that matters. Um, but ProVerif is very valuable. So, um, <clears throat> so good. Let me say a little bit about actually writing these models. Um, there's a lot to it, but I want to go into some detail about writing uh, security goals. So our main goal is confidentiality, right? And so what we want to know is like, if the protocol is done, if Blake's received the message and said everything's good, um, but the attacker also knows the session key that was output, if confidentiality is broken, what could have happened? We want a detailed, uh, exhaustive list of all the cases that could have broken that confidentiality to feel like we un really understand what security we have achieved with our protocol. Okay. Well, you know, so you might look at the, the protocol um, pretty quickly and say, ah, oh, well, I see, there's a few things that could have happened. Like, if the attacker knows the session key, well, the attacker could have compromised Alex and then figure out the session key. The, maybe the quantum apocalypse happened, right? Diffie-Hellman's broken. Then the attacker could know the session key. Uh, actually, when you look at it, if, if the attacker just compromised um, Blake's signed pre-key, that would be enough. Um, yeah, and you could run this. You could make this your security goal. Um, and um, it's going to give a proof. Like, that's true. Um, but it's really a very unsatisfying proof because this didn't say anything about what we're interested in. It didn't say anything about forward security. Right? It didn't say anything about Harvest Now to Crypt Later. Uh, we need to try again, get a little more detail because the timing matters. Because um, if the responder's done, if Blake is done and the attacker knows uh, SK, really what could have happened was um, Alex could have been compromised at some time J before time I when the protocol completed. Okay, then the attacker is able to, con to impersonate Alex and know the key. Okay, similarly, if Diffie Hellman was broken at some time J before time I, then the attacker would be able to figure out the key um, or if they compromised uh, Blake's signed pre key before time I. So now we're getting a little more precise. Um, if you run this in ProVerif, you're going to find an attack. This is not comprehensive. We're missing things that could happen. Because what if Diffie-Hellman is broken after time I? Now, this is the problem we're trying to solve. We're trying to provide Harvest Now to Crypt later protection. Well, it turns out that there are things the attacker could still do if Diffie-Hellman is broken after um, to, to find this. One of them is if the chem's broken. If the chem's in, insecure and Diffie-Hellman's broken, then all is lost. Right. Uh, <clears throat> the attacker could also compromise Blake's post-quantum pre-key any time afterwards and still break all the security. Or there's a couple of uh, more detailed compromises that could have happened before the, the protocol was done. Okay. Similarly, if Blake's signed pre-key was compromised after time I, we've got a similar list of events break down. And it turns out that this is enough. I mean, this is kind of a sprawling query, but you can find essentially this in our models on GitHub. Okay. And, but walking you through it, I, I wanted to point out that every line is here for a reason. Uh, this will give us a security proof. And if you take any one of these disjunctions out, um, we get an attack. Um, <clears throat> I can't formally say that this gives us a comprehensive result. There could be ways that we could go in and say, maybe this is tighter, but this is what we're striving for is we're trying to write the models. Okay. Um, you can find these models uh, online. Here's a link on GitHub. Um, definitely grab me, um, email me, whatever, if you want some help going through them. I think they're very fun to play with. 
Okay. So let me say then a bit about how we use CryptoVerif and ProVerif together to find attacks. Um, <clears throat> so overall, the way we worked on this, so um, we at Signal were working with um, Charlie, Karthik, and Franciscus kind of in this iterative process where they would produce models, um, find possible attacks. We come back, um, compare them to our implementation. Um, we might find things in their models, that, oh, find things in our implementation we think are missing and we wanted them to add it to their models. Uh, so it's uh, this uh, really back and forth process. Uh, along the way, at one point, we were unable to prove confidentiality using CryptoVera. But we found if we added domain separation to our signatures, um, that we could complete the proof in CryptoVerif. And so, you know, we might just say, okay, well, let's just go add domain separation. We're done. Right. It's a protocol flaw. But, you know, it's not satisfying. You want things to be in your protocol for a reason. And so we wanted to know, is this really a weakness in the protocol or is it a weakness in our ability to prove things? And this is where CryptoVerif comes in uh, very handy because we could go to, uh, this is where ProVerif comes in very handy um, because to answer that question, we can go to ProVerif and now, give the attacker explicit ability to confuse um, elliptic curve keys for chem keys and give them under the presumption that performing a chem encapsulation on an invalid input, an elliptic curve key, is, is insecure. We give the attacker extreme power. And when I'm talking about how black and white ProVerif is here, we're giving a, an attacker this function, weak EC as chem says that if somebody encapsulates, uh, performs an invalid encapsulation on an elliptic curve key, the attacker can use this function, weak EC as chem, to recover the shared secret. Um, no questions asked. Okay, so it's a very powerful tool we're giving the attacker. Um, and this might give you a taste of why this uh, much less, the ProVerif models, the formal model results are much less subtle than computational model ones. Um, in any case, uh, we give those attackers that power, and boom, right away, ProVerif spits out an attack. And uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's pretty straightforward to read these traces. The fun part happens here in step 20, where it says by 19, the attacker may know PN, that's a post quantum encapsulation of uh, this S mole. This is our weak, this is our elliptic curve key. Um, so PN of S mole, all of this is just our weak ciphertext. The attacker knows the weak ciphertext. Using the function weak EC as Kim, the attacker may obtain a shared secret. It is game over. So in practice, this couldn't happen because in our implementation, we always put um, type key type bytes as prefixes to, to our keys. We had not put that in the specification. It is now in the specification, right? And we found uh, a number of other details like this that we needed to, to make more precise. Okay. Um, after iterating like this, we had a revised protocol and we had security proofs. We had models that we at Signal were happy with. We felt they faithfully represented what we were doing and a, a protocol that was precise and um, expressed our intentions too. So uh, we had a proof in the symbolic security theorem, um, pretty much saying um, that uh, we still had confidentiality and had HNDL protection. Um, more importantly for us, we had a proof um, with CryptoVerif that we did not break our Diffie-Hellman based security and a proof with CryptoVerif with the post-quantum extension that we obtained the harvest now decrypt later protection we wanted. Okay. Um, one of the most interesting things that came out, probably for me, the most interesting thing that came out of that process, though, was a certain chem re-encapsulation attack we found. Um, so uh, this is a, a re-encapsulation attack on the version one of our PP. PQXDH specification. Uh, how it works is um, things start out that Blake generates some, some keys, has a post quantum um, chem key. They generate PQSPK and then is compromised by Charlie. So Charlie obtains the post quantum chem public key, signature, and secret key. Then life goes on. Blake recovers. Blake has uncompromised keys now and wants to talk to Alex. So Blake sends a message to Alex uh, to initiate a handshake and does that with uncompromised key PQPK prime. Right. Charlie intercepts this and swaps out PQPK prime and its signature for PQPK, the compromised key and its signature and forwards that message on um, to Alex. 
Alex gets that and cannot detect anything wrong. This is a valid key, valid signature, runs the protocol um, as desired, generates a session key, produces the associated data, um, produces a message ciphertext and sends it back. Now, Charlie is gonna be very helpful here because you see Alex just encapsulated uh, this key uh, as, as this shared secret um, <clears throat> with PQPK. And Blake is expecting something that was encapsulated with PQPK prime. And Charlie's gonna fix this problem for them because Charlie knows the shared, the, knows the secret key for PQPK, it's compromised. Charlie can decapsulate the ciphertext CT uh, to, to learn that, uh, that shared secret. And then without violating CCA indistinguishability for the chem, Charlie can re-encapsulate that same shared secret under key PQ, PK prime to produce a new ciphertext CT prime send that back to, to Blake. Blake runs a protocol, decapsulates, produces the same shared secret um, that Alex did. Everything checks out. The protocol is complete. Everybody is happy, but two of them should not be happy, <laughs> right? Because Charlie knows their post-quantum shared secret. Oh, um, okay, here we go. So, we have no session independence. We have no agreement on the post-quantum public key that was used. A compromise of one post-quantum pre-key broke HNDL protection for all other post-quantum pre-keys of the party going forward. Uh, this is not good. So um, <clears throat> in our protocol specification, we say now that if your chem does not have certain binding properties, then you need to add that post-quantum chem public key to uh, the associated data for your AEAD ciphertext. And we prove that that solves the problem. But we wanna know, well, what binding properties do we actually need? What security properties do we need in our chem? Uh, so um, I'll propose one. I, I'm not gonna say that this is the weakest security property needed, but it's a, a relatively weak security property that would solve the problem for us. There's some other attacks that are more subtle um, and that this one takes care of too. And uh, here the real um, definition is, is up there on the right if you want to read it and pardon my attempt to kind of describe it in English. But here, if an agent encapsulates um, a shared secret SSCT with an attacker provided uh, key PK prime and a different agent decapsulates attacker chosen ciphertext CT prime with their own honestly generated but compromised key and the attacker wins if the malicious CT prime decapsulates to the same shared secret SS under the honestly generated but compromised SK. Okay. With that, we can prove a couple of theorems using CryptoVer. So we call this semi-honest collision resistance. We can prove that Kyber is semi-honest collision resistant. Um, and we can prove that PQXDH guarantees agreement over the post-quantum sign pre-key um, if the CAM is SHCR. Okay. Essentially giving us what we need here. Um, Absolutely, we are not saying that this is a security property that chem should aim for. We're just saying that it's our observation this is a security property that um, like, is what is needed in our particular situation. Uh, so it's interesting though to compare it to um, some other chem security properties that have been proposed uh, recently. For example, um, X-Wing. The first version of X-Wing introduced ciphertext collision resistance, uh, where essentially, uh, with an honestly genera generated compromised key, an attacker tries to find two ciphertexts that decapsulate to the same value. It sounds very similar, uh, but we can actually prove that it's logically independent from semi-honest collision resistance. Um, keeping up with the chems introduced like a, a rich set of chem security properties. Um, none of them directly match semi-honest collision resistance though, but we can definitely prove that uh, the property where the key maliciously binds the ciphertext in the public key um, does imply semi-honest collision resistance. Uh, there's a nice quote from that paper, Kim's that satisfy key binding properties, um, will the, our key binding properties will leave fewer pitfalls for protocol designers. Our experience absolutely bears that out. I also wanna say though, in the end, the responsibility for this lies with the protocol designer. The primitive designers can't do everything for us. So, 
Um, <clears throat> Uh, so there's a lot more boring crypto we do. We're definitely uh, interested in working on the, the ratchet. That's one I also hesitate to say is boring. We start to, to, to blur the lines. Uh, there's a lot of fun stuff there. Uh, stay tuned. Um, like I said, we use noise protocol all over, all over the place. Uh, we're in the process. We partially deployed um, a noise protocol with hybrid forward secrecy extension um, for enclave to enclave communication. And we're working on the rollout for client to enclave communication here. Um, this is important because for both our secure value recovery system and our contact discovery system, this is a harvest now to crypt later risk. Um, we have um, custom hybrid public key encryption all over the place, signatures, whatnot, you name it, throughout the app. Uh, we're kind of inventorying these and deciding when we need to take care of what. Um, the, the noise protocols are important and we're extending the use of noise protocol in our system. So we want to take care of that quickly. Okay, so good, that's a boring cryptography. And uh, we still have an enormous amount of work to do there. Let's talk about the, the place where we have work that we don't even know how to do, fancy cryptography. I don't think I need to convince anybody that it's interesting. Um, here, I'm just gonna have a lot of questions. I'll start with the one that I think the picture is like becoming the clearest. And this is back to our handshake. So I just described in some detail PQXDH, which provided harvest now to crypt later protection but was certainly not fully post-quantum secure. Eventually we want a fully post-quantum secure or a hybrid replacement for this, okay? Um, one of the properties I haven't said too much about though is that we insist on deniability for our handshake. Now we're not sure exactly what deniability means. I think there's a lot of definitions floating around. Um, some of them we're not claiming like the strongest sorts of deniability that are claimed out there, but in order to use deny, in order to attain deniability in a handshake, it seems that we're going to need to use things that fall under the, the name fancy crypto. Something like ring signatures, designated verifier signatures, split chems, um, and so on. There, there's more, and I know some of you out here in the audience have been working on these and showing how we can do these things. Okay. Then we get to something that is very wide open for us, our private group system. So our private group system is designed to allow us to manage groups without knowledge of who is in a group with whom. Okay, it's built um, on an anonymous uh, key verifier, anonymous credential system, which at its foundation consists of algebraic maps, verifiable encryption, and some very tailored um, credential presentations in your knowledge groups. Um, all of these depend on Diffie-Hellman assumptions for Ristretto 255. And uh, beyond the group system, we're actually using this anonymous credential system elsewhere through our app, for example, uh, to authorize access to badges, calling, creation, and, and more. Um, and we don't see any, there's like no primitive that you can drop in and replace here. It's a, a fairly complicated system. Unfortunately, the verifiable encryption here is a harvest now to crypt later issue for our metadata because we hold the database of encrypted group membership rosters that are encrypted with secret keys known only to group members. Um, but the verifiable encryption we use, it's very proof friendly, um, but it's absolutely not quantum safe. It's just uh, the group secret is two scalars, two secret scalars for Ristretto 255. And the encryption is just you take the hash of the user ID to a point and the encoding of the user ID to a point and perform this invertible linear transformation on it. And uh, a little uh, sketch in your sketchbook, you can see that a quantum attacker who obtains one plain text ciphertext pair is going to be able to figure out the secret key and figure out who is in a group. That is not good. We want to eliminate this. We're not sure what to do. Uh, throwing around ideas like replacing the verifiable encryption with something like a block cipher and a snark probably doesn't need to be a snark. Uh, it's not clear we need succinctness. Uh, we need to kind of look at the performance requirements, communication costs and everything throughout the system. Um, and more broadly, I think we need to evaluate the entire group system, including the way we send messages, use sender keys and, and more. Okay. Um, also as an alternative to, to um, anonymous credentials, we use um, partially blind signatures um, too in a very privacy pass like way. It's not exactly privacy pass. And we rely heavily on the homomorphic properties of these signatures to, to do what we need to do with them. 
Uh, right now, it's largely a spam fighting tool, so maybe not an urgent problem, but we certainly don't know how to replace it in a post-quantum way, and we would like to use these more extensively. Um, OPRFs for our secure value recovery system. Um, this is a, a big challenge for us uh, because well, we really like the, the design of our newest version of our secure value recovery system. It's a password protected secret sharing system where the workhorse is an oblivious pseudo random function um, that's based on Diffie Hellman operations. It's absolutely not post quantum and it is an important attack now or harvest now to crypt later target. Um, <clears throat> we're providing very heavy handed HMDL protection. We're making these um, OPRF calls inside uh, post quantum part in this protocol channel. And uh, I believe we're going to need to transform the password prote protected secret sharing scheme into a full threshold pick. Um, but what does a post quantum replacement look like? We don't know. Um, also, we're investigating an application that would use uh, verifiable random functions. Um, again, just wide open for us, and maybe some of you know how to, to solve these problems. So we need fancy crypto to provide the features we want to provide to our users with the security we promise to our users. Drop-in replacements for primitives would be great. We don't really see that. But what we really need to do is just have to figure, figure out how to continue to securely deliver these features. So uh, I'll wrap this up. Basically, what we're saying, you know, we are carefully moving towards post-quantum security. Our main goal right now is harvest now to crypt later protection. Um, we're kind of forced into hybridization uh, because we don't want to take away any of the diffie hellman back security. Um, I think we're seeing that even protocols built with standard primitives um, can be very challenging to get right, formal verification, is an important tool for us that I think we're going to expand its use. And uh, as far as the fancy crypto, we need it, but we've barely, under, barely begun. Um, and there's many places we just don't know what to do. Um, we have problems. We put solutions into practice um, and we would love your help, anybody who has ideas. So uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for the great talk. Are there any questions? Okay, then. Uh, oh. Are you thinking about post quantum signatures soon, or where is that in the timeline? So, um, yeah, so I think the, the, the first place we would think about that is in uh, the initial handshake. Uh, it wouldn't be a direct signature. We would need something like a, a ring signature to. Um, to maintain deniability. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, the places where we use uh, classical signatures in our applications seem less urgent, uh, but we certainly want to have the, the list and be ready to go. Um, and if the signature sizes get smaller, then sure. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I have a question on the, uh, the model that you were considering. So how generic is your model to catch every sort of attack vectors, uh, for example, there is side chain attack, which is quite serious. And so devices are on people's hands, so they can be easily subject to side chain attacks. So are you considering that sort of attack in your model as well? Uh, so I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part of the question. The side channel attack? Oh, yeah. So here we are not, with those models, we are not analyzing side channel attacks. Um, uh, yeah, no, that's uh, out of scope for this. Although uh, certainly I, I don't want to, we are concerned about them, of course, and, and try to be careful. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, then if not, let's uh, thank Rolf again.